Father saw fit to give many titles to his Holy Spirit that he sent to us. It, and by those names, it helps us to more understand just what the benefits and uh, of the Holy Spirit is and, and the work that he uh, was given in the Godhead to do in our salvation. Uh, and it is really, we need to fully understand the divine character of the Holy Spirit. It is really the foundation of godliness. It should be one of our main goals to search for the knowledge of God aided by the assistance of the Holy Spirit. And without the true knowledge of God and his nature and the attributes, we cannot worship him as we should. We cannot worship him with reverence nor serve him as we should. And the names that were given describe the Godhead. The three persons in the Godhead are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they have graciously revealed themselves by different names and titles to us. We are in and of ourselves utterly incapable of understanding or comprehending the nature of God. But we can from Scripture, and this is a blessed word in itself, his word that he sent to us through Christ, it gives us the ability to understand and appreciate and to worship. And this is how he reveals himself to us how, and how he would have us know him and how he would have us serve him. Therefore, by whatever name that God expresses himself to be, he is. He will not deceive us by giving names that will not give us understanding to him. He will not give us names that are misleading. He will only give us names of himself that endure him to us and reveal his nature to us. He will not deceive us again, I say, by not giving us misleading names because he requires us to trust in his name because he will surely by, be found by all that he is and all that his name means to us. Revelations 19.13 He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. That should immediately make us think of John, the first chapter, those first few verses. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. It is through the hearing of the Word that He calls us to His Son. It is how we believe what a magnificent thing the Word of God is, that He should even choose to send His Word to us and reveal Him to us by which we are saved. And then He gives in this book, all of His benefits are described in this book, and all the gifts that He has chosen to give to His people are revealed in His Holy Word. And then he has chosen to seal us and give us a pledge of our inheritance through the Holy Spirit that is in us. And it, that's, I do not think that we can fully comprehend all that he has done for us and given to us. And so the names of God are for the purpose of revealing himself to us. They manifest his perfections and make known the different relationships that he confirms to us, the adopted children of God. The names of God are given that they might state his holy attributes. When God created Adam and he gave him dominion, you know, Adam, look about you in a sense was what it was. You are given dominion of these things. You will be given charge. You, you will have duties to perform in these, but do not eat of the tree that is in the garden. And of course we know that 
uh, Eve uh, could not obey and neither could Adam. He succumbed to the temptations of his wife that was presented to him. But God assigned a marvelous thing to Adam when he said in Genesis 2.19, he said, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them and whatever the man called a living creature that was its name so in the same way we learn the attributes of, of God by his names and his titles he has given to himself and by these means God reveals himself to us sometimes by one of his perfections and sometimes by another. And so in scripture, the Holy Bible is a very large and gracious, and I say gracious, he would not have had to reveal himself to us, but he chose to do so. But it's a gracious field of study that he has provided for us. And I just ask that it may bless us. So what the Holy Spirit is in his divine person and his indescribable character is made known to us by the various names that he was given and the different titles which are attributed to him in the Holy Scriptures. And our humble prayer really should be that we will be guided with the Spirit of God in an attempt to magnify, manifest, and to glorify the third person in the Holy Trinity, and that it should serve as an incentive for us to give more careful study and holy meditation of all the titles that God has given to us. And to this I say amen. Yeah. So there is agreement in the Trinity the Holy Spirit is designated by many titles and, and in the scriptures and they clearly reveal both his personality and his deity. He is God. Let us not forget that. Some of these are peculiar to himself only. Others he has in common with the Father and the Son. And in the undivided grace and purpose of the divine nature. In the magnificent purpose and, and grace of redemption, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are revealed to us by their distinct offices by which we are taught to attribute certain works to one more directly than the other. And yet the work of each one should not be considered to be separate, but to we must understand that they cooperate and agree. For this reason, the third person in the Trinity is called the Spirit of the Father. Romans 8.14 tells us that. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And the Spirit of the Son in Galatians uh, 4.6, God has sent forth His Son, the Spirit of His Son, into our hearts, crying what? Abba, Father. The Spirit acts in conjunction with the Father and the Son. The work and the purpose of one is in effect the work of the others. And all together they result from the inseparable union that is in the Godhead. And the titles uh, that are used in Scripture, first he is designated the Spirit, which expresses two things. First, his divine nature. It says, for God is Spirit. In John 4.24, he is pure, a spirit distinct from any material or visible substance. Second, it expresses his manner of redemptive work in the heart of God's people which is in scripture it is compared to as breath or the movement of wind uh, both of which describe him in the lower part of this regions of the of the earth or the world appropriately in as much as his attributes his attributes are invisible and yet they are eternal and life-giving elements 
we see the results of the Holy Spirit that is given to his people. People that walked in a manner or course in their life that was unholy and ungodly before the Holy Spirit was imparted to them and revealed in their nature completely changed us from a step that we were going in to a step that was now becoming, we started to walk in holiness. And that is the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in of our life. It is, was given to us at our regeneration when our attitudes were, were changed, uh, where our desires and our natures were completely changed. But all of that was determined before the foundation of the world. It was determined that God would change our walk or our course, that, that unholy life that we all dwelt in at a time. And I do not want anyone to ever say that there was not a time of unholiness in their life. It is impossible. If that were to be the case, then there would be no need for God to give us repentance. It is by the good and the long-lasting forbearance of God with us that we were granted our repentance. And I believe that's revealed in Romans, the second chapter, the fourth verse. It clearly says that. So he has designated the Spirit it expresses two things. First, his divine nature for God is spirit. We went over that. John 4, 24. He is pure, a spirit that is distinct from any substance. And so, it, secondly, it expresses his redemptive work on the heart of the people of God, which is compared to in Scripture as breath or the movement of wind, both of which describes him in the lower world. We've gone over that. So, in Ezekiel 37, 9, we see this prayer. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. Therefore, it was in his public descent on the day of Pentecost. And he said, suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, Acts, the second chapter, the second verse. So he is distinctly called the Holy Spirit, which is his most normal designation in the New Testament. Two things are included here. First, respect is given to his nature as Jehovah. It is distinguished from all false gods in this manner because he is holy. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? Exodus 15, 11. The Spirit is also called holy to indicate his holiness or his nature. And this is seen clearly in Mark, the third chapter, 29 through 30. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Therefore, enmity is made between his undefiled nature and that of an unclean or an unholy spirit. We need to understand also how this verse establishes clear proof of his personality. For the unclean spirit is a person, and if the spirit were not a person, no difference could be made between them. Uh, and also here we see his absolute deity in respect to all his works. For every good work of God is holy. And also in hardening and blinding. And that's maybe something that we do not understand. Romans 11:8, just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And then in Romans, the ninth chapter, the 18th verse, so then he has mercy upon whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. And equally also in regeneration, in Titus, the third chapter, 5 and 7. 
He saved us not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to the washing of regeneration, and here it comes, renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by grace, we would be made heirs according to the expectation of eternal life. And Paul goes on to say that, that, that Titus should speak confidently about these things so that those who have believed God will be <laughs> careful to engage in good deeds. And then by engaging in good deeds, it's profitable for us to do that. And the amazing thing about that is we see in Ephesians, uh, I believe it's 2.13, that said that uh, God has created these good works for us to walk in. And then he rewards us for walking in the good works that he prepared for us to do. Third, oh, 1 Peter 1.2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours and to the fullest measure. It is a sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit that causes us to be obedient to Jesus Christ. Third, he is called God's good spirit from Nehemiah 9th chapter the 20th verse. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. And he's our teacher. In Psalms 143.10, let your good spirit lead me on level ground. And he is the author of every good desire and holy purpose. He is called the good spirit because of his nature, which is good. Matthew 19.17 declares that very clearly. There is none good but one, that is God. Fourth, he is called the free spirit. In Psalm 5, 51, the 12th verse, in the King James Version, uh, the New American Standard does not state the good spirit. He is called so because he is most gracious giver. He imparts his favors without measure as he pleases, literally, and not, you know, not chastising us because it is his work to deliver God's elect from the bondage of sin and the corruption that is in the world by lust. And he does that. And he brings us to his glorious liberty of God's children. And it is magnificent, and we do not fully understand that. Second Peter 1, 1, 4. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them we may become partakers of the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world by lust. And fifth, he is called the Spirit of Christ. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. In Romans 8, 9, because sent by him, by God, Acts 2, 33, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth that which you see and hear. And for this reason to glorify Christ, John 16, 14, Christ says, He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me, for he will take of mine and he will disclose it to you. The divine nature by the indwelling Holy Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3.8. How will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? And I don't know if the ministers or the preachers that step into the pulley, pulpit fully understand that. I wonder maybe if some depend upon themselves too much, you know, and expect the work of God to be, be accomplished by their eloquence or, or their knowledge or something. But when in all respects, if, they're, if the preaching the word of God produces a result in someone, it is totally by the spirit of God. It, it is nothing in and of themselves that causes that. The minister is to be a servant of God and to faithfully dispense God's word to God's children. That is their duty. 
And then what God does with that word that is implanted in his people, what God does with that is his business. And he will bring that out of all of his children in some instance. An instance will be presented to all of us where we will be able to give God's word to somebody. But that was a purpose and a time that is chosen by God. And we should thank him for that. He's called the spirit of Christ. Again, because if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they are none of his. And so... In the sixth, he is called the Spirit of God. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. Acts 8.39 Because he possesses divine authority and requires unhesitating submission to him. Seventh, he is called the eternal spirit, Hebrews 9.14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Amen. Among the names and the titles of the Holy Spirit is known in Scripture, he's called the eternal spirit. And it, is, it is his holy designation, a name which defines his nature and it carries with it convincing proof of the Godhead. None but the high and holy one who inhabits eternity can be called eternal. Now Christians who possess the gift of immortality. It may be said that they were created for eternity. They may enjoy through the graciousness of their creator a future eternal life. But this is really as different as the, the East as is from the West when applied to the Holy Spirit. He alone possesses underived independent self-existence. Who was and is and who has come can be said in exclusion of all other beings to be eternal. Robert Hawker said that. I really kind of like reading Robert Hawker because he calls his, his commentary the poor man's commentary and that typically addresses me. <laughs> uh, it's understandable and I enjoy reading what this man of God has written. Eighth, he's called the paraclete or the comforter in John 14, 16. And there's really no, no better translation can be given if, the, if we are to keep the English word in, in mind. Comforter means more than, uh, than counts consoler. Uh, it is derived from two Latin words, calm, means to, to come alongside of and fortis and means strength. So the Holy Spirit is one who comes alongside of us and gives us strength in those times that we can see no hope before us at all. In those times when our hearts are, are tried to their utmost, it is at those times that the peace of God comes upon us through that Holy Spirit. He comes alongside of us and aids us in those times. Those dark times when we really think that there's nothing good going to occur, but it is those times He strengthens us. And what a marvelous blessing that is. So a comforter is one who stands alongside of us who are in need to strengthen us and to give comfort to us. When Christ said he would ask the Father to give his people another comforter, another, he signified that the Spirit would take his place. And he would not only aid the disciples that were spreading the gospel throughout that whole region, he would not only aid them, but the Spirit being eternal is the one that is comforting us, the one that is sanctifying us, the one that is making us fit for God or 
proper for God, when we say fit for God. He's the one that cleanses us because no unholy thing can stand in the presence of God. He makes us holy. And how he does that, I do not know. We only see the result of that. And God sees the result of that. So he said that the Spirit would take his place. And in 1 John, I, I love this verse, and I love the teaching that Tony has given us in 1 John. 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. I can imagine John sitting here writing these words down. He wants us to know, not only those at that time, but all the generation now and the generation that will come after us. He says, what was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, and what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. I, I don't know if there's any greater statement in Scripture than probably, John, except for maybe John 3.16. But what they have seen, what they were willing to suffer death for, what they were willing to be martyred for, because they had seen the Word of God, the Word of life. They had seen Jesus Christ. They had talked to God when He was here on earth. The Spirit strengthens in many ways. He consoles us when we're downcast. He gives grace when we're weak or, or timid. And he guides us when we're unsure. He's that voice that sometimes impels us to do things that we do not know the result of even when we start out to do it. And when it is accomplished, oh my word, God caused that to happen. He impelled us to do those things. He directed our steps. J.C. Philpott wrote this in 1863. Do not let anyone think that the doctrine of the distinct personality of the Holy Spirit is a mere strife. And what he means by that, a lack of harmony of words or unimportant matter or an unprofitable discussion which we may take or leave, believe or deny without any injury to our faith or our hope. On the contrary, let this be firmly impressed on your mind that if you deny or disbelieve the personality of the Blessed Spirit, you deny and disbelieve with it the grand foundation truth of the Trinity. If your doctrine is in sound, your experience must be a delusion and your practice is an imposition. What marvelous, marvelous words. And so the covenant offices of the Holy Spirit, the eternal covenant is what we're talking about. It may be you know, some people may not, it may be new to them. Uh, they may not fully understand it, but it is an everlasting covenant. It joins with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. But we need to understand the relationship of the Holy Spirit in the eternal covenant. And so, to give us a scripture reference, I, I thought of Hebrews 13, 20. Uh, now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, the promises of God are a covenant that he made. It was nothing that we made an agreement with him like that covenant that was made at Sinai you know, when the people said, this we will do, and they could not do. God had gave man a chance to save himself, and he could not accomplish it. But now the covenant we stand is, is a, actually it's a promise. And the promises of God are yes and amen. So the Holy Spirit in his covenant office are, are intimately connected. Then they come from his deity and his personality. If he had not been a divine person in the Godhead, we would not and could not have taken part in the covenant of grace. It would be an impossibility. Here are some definitions. The covenant of grace 
refers to the holy and solemn compact entered into between the holy persons of the Trinity on behalf of the elect. It's what they agreed to do on behalf of the elect. And that was before the foundation of the world. By the word offices, we can understand the, in, the entirety of that part of that sacred compact which the Holy Spirit undertook to perform. If anyone can imagine that the application of such a term to the third person of the Godhead is derogatory by calling it an office. It is not derogatory, but it speaks of his unspeakable glory. And, and it needs to be made clear that it does not suggest subordination or inferiority. It signifies a particular mission it is a trust, it is a duty, or a work given for the beneficial purpose of God's children. And we see that it, we're, giving a, a, we're given a little bit of description that, of that in the office of the priest. You know, like in Exodus 28.1, uh, God says, Then bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the sons of Israel to minister as a priest to me. And then in Luke 1.8, Speaking of Zechariah, now it happened while he was performing his priestly service, and that is in the King James Version. We need to understand that before God in the appointed order of his division, the apostolic office in Romans 11.13, but I am speaking to you who are Gentiles inasmuch then as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, then I magnify my ministry. Again, and that's in the King James Version. And it says office in the King James Version. It's a diaconia. It's a, a role or position of one serving God in a special way or a task that is assigned to them. It is ministry. And so there is nothing wrong with us using the word office to express the various duties of the Son, and the Holy Spirit that they undertook in the covenant of grace. As persons in the Trinity, they are equal. They are covenanting parties. They were equal. They gloriously and graciously condescended and took on in their beings to transmit to the church indescribable favors and indescribable favors and, and blessings. And there is a diversity in their offices. And they graciously volunteered and entered into. And it does not destroy or diminish that original equality in which they had with God the Father. And so Christ took upon himself the office of servant. And so it no way tarnishes or, or cancels his equality as the son in Matthew 20, 28 we read of that he said just as the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many so the spirit he freely undertook the office of applying the benefits of the eternal covenant or the covenant of grace to his beneficiaries and so it no way uh, detracts from his essential personal honor and glory. The word office as applied to the covenant work of the Holy Spirit manifests that work which he graciously undertook to perform the entirety of his divine pledge and performance on behalf of God's election, the election of grace. So, to those who have understanding and a, a believing heart, there is in the covenant itself, the facts of it, and in the provisions of it, something that is completely marvelous and precious. 
that even that there was a covenant of all at all is, is magnificent in a covenant that God chose to do himself and it required nothing of us but just continued to shower his blessings upon us one after another. We can't hold all the blessings that he has given to us. To be called a son of God, to be an adopted child, that God chose to do it, not that he saw anything in and of ourselves that was worthy for the son to die for, but it says that Christ took that on that cross on because of the, his love for us and the joy that was set before him he did endure, endured the cross and he despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God to do what? There to make intercession for us. He holds his priesthood permanently because he lives forever. And then they used, they took the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit condescended to apply that grace to us and to sanctify us and to make us fit for heaven and the eternal life that God had chosen for his people. So the Spirit's office in the covenant is sanctification. It means to set aside, to, to make holy. In 2 Samuel 23, 5, Truly is not my house so with God, for he made an everlasting covenant with me, ordered in all things and secured for all my salvation and all desire. Will he not make it grow? And that's Second Samuel twenty three five, and so the office or the or the work of the Holy Spirit in connection is with the everlasting covenant, and it can be summed up in one word: sanctification, a setting aside. The third person of the Holy Trinity agreed to sanctify the objects of God's eternal election and the son's redeeming satisfaction the spirit's work of sanctification was just as needful as the indispensable they were indispensable for the church's salvation as was the obedience or the shed blood of Jesus Christ it is all the covenant of the Trinity. Adam's fall plunged the, the church into immeasurable depth of suffering and wretchedness. The image of God in which all mankind had been created was marred with sin. Sin like a disgusting leprosy. It affected them to the very core you see, all the children of God and, and the ministers are, are somewhat uh, restrained in this manner because we being earthly people, we cannot truly understand the holiness of God. We cannot understand how holy he is. We cannot fully understand the requirements of God. And we know, we know that because the believers, we know that we cannot justify ourselves before God. But he took holiness, a pure holiness that is indescribable. And the longer I try to explain it, the less I explain it. We cannot understand the holiness of God completely. But why? It is such a holiness that requires a son to sacrifice his life for, and it is such a holiness that he has asked his, his spirit, the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, to dwell in our hearts by faith, and therefore working out our sanctification and marking us as his chosen people and also pledging us to God. It is a promise that was made to God in Ephesians. It says, as the spirit of promise with a view to the redemption of God's own people. So that sin that they did in, in the beginning, it, was, it spread like leprosy. But God, or the Holy Spirit, pledged to sanctify 
people. Without the Spirit's sanctification, the redemption of Christ would profit us nothing. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. So it is true that the perfect atonement was made by Christ and a perfect righteousness was brought in and so the people or the elect are legally reconciled to God. But God Almighty is holy as well and he is just and the use and enjoyment of his dwelling place can only be enjoyed by those that are made holy. And and we see in the book of Revelations that the, the ministers are, that are standing before God's throne, what are they crying out? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. As I, Isaiah 6, 3 says that. So then the question would be, how could any unholy or unregenerate, unsanctified sinner dwell in the holy and pure place in which... Scripture says this, nothing unclean and no one who practice abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, Revelation 21, 17. Are we able to understand the wonder of covenant grace and covenant love? The most loathsome of sinners, the most degenerate sinner, the lowest persons can and will enter through gates into the holy city. And how do we know that? 1 Corinthians 6.11 And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God, the Spirit of our God. And so it, it should be clear just, just from what has been said that sanctification is an indispensable part just as justification is indispensable. We must remember and understand that which, what we have learned so far is that the gracious work of the Spirit on the soul of God's people. So by this he makes God's people eternally fit for the kingdom of heaven. And it does not matter. And so scripture says this, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's for, that would be 1 John 3, 6. No matter how well educated... No matter how nice, no matter how well clothed in religious ornamentation, mankind cannot change the original nature of the raw material in and themselves. No matter how hard we would try to change cotton into wool or flax into silk, no matter how we would twist it or spin it or, or weave it or bleach it, no matter how long we would work on it, we could never change that. And here's a sobering fact. Man-made preachers and entire groups of religionists may work night and day to change flesh into spirit, but they and they may work from cradle to grave to equip people for heaven, but after all their labors to rub the spots off of a leopard, flesh is still flesh and cannot by any possibility enter the kingdom of God. Nothing but the supernatural operation of the Holy Spirit will succeed. Not only is mankind polluted to the very core, by original sin and actual sin. But there is in man and woman an 
absolute incapacity to understand or cherish or crave spiritual things. That says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness to him. He can't understand them because they're spiritually understood. But the spiritual man, he appraises all things, yet he is appraised or judged by no man. So, there is an imperative necessity of the Spirit's work of sanctification. It rests not only in the sinfulness of the man or, or woman, but in the state of spiritual death by which we are unable to live or breathe or respond to God. And that it's just as a corpse in the graveyard is unable to leave that grave and, and walk around cannot walk around. We know little of God's word and of God and little of our own hearts if we need proof of a fact which confronts us at every turn. The vileness of our nature and the thorough deadness of carnal hearts when we were enslaved to sin. It's just, and please don't let anyone think that they were good from the cradle. Do not let anyone think that they were fit and proper for God's kingdom when they were born although it was predestined for you to be his child it was predestined for you to be adopted through the blood of Jesus Christ it was predestined for you to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit a person that is born blind does not have the natural ability to see and no matter how many arguments or threats or promises that we make will make them be able to see. But a miracle has to be done. And the miracle is the calling of God and the predestination of God. And you are a recipient, recipient of that miracle of God because you were given faith to believe. So, let the Lord touch the eye with his divine hand and they will see at once. And though they cannot explain how or why, they can say to all, like they said in John 9.25, whether he is a sinner I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. So it's in the same manner, it is in the Spirit's work of sanctification that begun at our regeneration. When a new life was given to us, a new capacity was given to us and were imparted to us. And there was a new desire that was awakened in our heart. And it is carried forward in a daily work of renewal, 2 Corinthians 4.16. Therefore... We do not lose heart, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's work is completed when we stand in the presence of His glory, Jude 124. And it should be emphasized. What should be emphasized is, is this, that whether the Spirit is convicting us or working repentance in us or aiding us in our prayer or taking of the things of Christ and showing them to us, it shows them to our heart. He is, dis he is discharging His covenant offices when that is accomplished. And so may we render unto him the praise and worship which his is due. Amen.